The Individual, Society, and the State, written by Emma Goldman in 1940, read by Sen Naomi Kirschholz, June 2nd, 2022. The minds of men are in confusion, for the very foundations of our civilization seem to be tottering. People are losing faith in the existing institutions, and the more intelligent realize that capitalist industrialism is defeating the very purpose it's supposed to serve. The world is at a loss for a way out. Parliamentarism and democracy are on the decline. Salvation is being sought in fascism and other forms of strong, quote-unquote, government. The struggle of opposing ideas now going on in the world involves social problems urgently demanding a solution. The welfare of the individual and the fate of human society depend on the right answer to those questions. The crisis, unemployment, war, disarmament, international relations, etc. are among those problems. The state, government, with its functions and powers, is now the subject of vital interest to every thinking man. Political developments in all civilized countries have brought the questions home. Shall we have a strong government? Are democracy and parliamentary government to be preferred, or is fascism of one kind or another, dictatorship, monarchical, bourgeoisie, or proletarian the solution to the ills and difficulties that beset society today? In other words, Shall we cure the evils of democracy by more democracy, or shall we cut the Gordian knot of popular government with the sword of dictatorship? My answer is neither the one nor the other. I'm against dictatorship and fascism, as I am opposed to the parliamentary regimes and so-called political democracy. Nazism has been justly called an attack on civilization. This characterization applies with equal force to every form of dictatorship, indeed to every kind of suppression and coercive authority. For what is civilization in the truest sense? All progress has been essentially an enlargement of the liberties of the individual with a corresponding decrease of the authority wielded over him by external forces. This holds good in the realm of physical as well as of political and economic existence. In the physical world, man has progressed to the extent in which he has subdued the forces of nature and made them useful to himself. Primitive man made a step on the road to progress when he first produced fire, and thus triumphed over darkness when he chained the wind or harnessed water. What role did authority or government play in human endeavor for betterment, in invention and discovery? None whatsoever, or at least none that was helpful. It has always been the individual that has accomplished every miracle in that sphere, usually in spite of the prohibition persecution and interference by authority, both human and divine. Similarly, in the political sphere, the road of progress lay in getting away more and more from the authority of the tribal chief or the clan, of prince and king, of government of the state. Economically, progress has meant greater well-being of even larger numbers. Culturally, it has signified the result of all the other achievements greater independence, political, mental, and psychic. Regarded from this angle, the problems of man's relation to the state assumes an entirely different significance. It is no more a question of whether dictatorship is preferable to democracy or Italian fascism superior to Hitlerism. A larger and far more vital question poses itself. Is political government, is the state beneficial to mankind? But how does it affect the individual in the social scheme of things? The individual is the true reality in life. A cosmos in himself, he does not exist for the state, nor for that abstraction called society or the nation, which is only a collection of individuals. Man, the individual, has always been and necessarily is the sole source and motive power of evolution and progress. Civilization has been a continuous struggle of the individual or of groups of individuals against the state, and even against society, quote-unquote that is, against the majority groups, subdued and hypnotized by the state and state worship. Man's greatest battles have been waged against man-made obstacles and artificial handicaps imposed upon him to paralyze his growth and development. Human thought has always been falsified by tradition and custom, and perverted false education in the interests of those who held power and enjoyed privileges. In other words, by the state and the ruling classes. This constant, incessant conflict has been the history of mankind.
individuality may be described as the consciousness of the individual as to what he is and how he lives, it is inherent in every human being and is a thing of growth. The state and social institutions come and go, but individuality remains and persists. The very essence of individuality is expression. The sense of dignity and independence is the soil wherein it thrives. Individuality is not the impersonal and mechanistic thing that the state treats as an individual. The individual is not merely the result of heredity and environment, of cause and effect. He is that, and a great deal more, a great deal else. The living man cannot be defined. He is the fountainhead of all life and all values. He is not a part of this or of that. He is a whole, an individual whole, a growing changing, and yet always constant whole. Individuality is not to be confused with the various ideas and concepts of individualism, much less with that of rugged individualism, which is only a masked attempt to repress and defeat the individual and his individuality. So-called individualism is the social and economic laissez-faire, the exploitation of the masses by the classes, by means of legal trickery, spiritual debasement, and systematic indoctrination of the servile spirit, which process is known as, quote-unquote, education. That corrupt and perverse individualism is the straitjacket of individuality. It has converted life into a degrading race for externals, for possession, for social prestige and supremacy. Its highest wisdom is, quote, the devil take the hindmost, end quote. This rugged individualism has inevitably resulted in the greatest modern slavery, the crassest class distinctions, driving millions to the breadline. Rugged individualism has meant all the individualism for the masters, while the people are regimented into a slave caste to serve a handful of self-seeking supermen. America is perhaps the best representative of this kind of individualism, in whose name political tyranny and social oppression are defended and held up as virtues while every aspiration and attempt of man to gain freedom and social opportunity to live is denounced as un-American and evil in the name of that same individualism. There was a time when the state was unknown. In his natural condition, man existed without any state or organized government. People lived as families in small communities. They tilled the soil, practiced arts and crafts. The individual, and later the family, was the unit of social life where each was free and the equal of his neighbor. Human society then was not a state but an association and a voluntary association for mutual protection and benefit. The elders and more experienced members were the guides and advisors of the people and they helped to manage the affairs of life, not to rule and dominate the individual. Political government and the state were a much later development growing out of the desire of the stronger to take advantage of the weaker, of the few against the many. The state, ecclesiastical and secular, served to give an appearance of legality and right to the wrong done by the few to the many. That appearance of right was necessary, the easier to rule the people, because no government can exist without the consent of the people, consent open, tacit or assumed. Constitutionalism and democracy are the modern forms of that alleged consent, consent being inoculated and indoctrinated by what is called education, at home, in the church, and in every other phase of life. That consent is the belief in authority and the necessity for it. At its base is the doctrine that man is evil, vicious, and too incompetent to know what is good for him. On this, all government and oppression is built. God and the state exist and are supported by this dogma. Yet the state is nothing but a name. It is an abstraction. Like other similar conceptions, nation, race, humanity has no organic reality. To call the state an organism shows a diseased tendency to make a fetish of words. The state is a term for the legislative and administrative machinery whereby certain business of the people is transacted and badly so. There is nothing sacred, nothing holy or mysterious about it. The state has no more conscience or moral mission than a commercial company for working a coal mine or running a railroad. The state has no more existence than gods and devils have. They are equally the reflex and creation of man for man, the individual, 
is the only reality. The state is but the shadow of man, the shadow of his opaqueness, of his ignorance and fear. Life begins and ends with man, the individual. Without him, there is no race, no humanity, no state. No, not even society is possible without man. It is the individual who lives, breathes, and suffers. His development, his advance, has been a continuous struggle against the fetishes of his own creation, and particularly so against the state. In former days, religious authority fashioned political life in the image of the church. The authority of the state, the rights, quote-unquote, of rulers came from on high. Power, like faith, was divine. Philosophers have written thick volumes to prove the sanctity of the state. Some have even clad it with infallibility and with godlike attributes. Some have talked themselves into the insane notion that the state is superhuman, the supreme reality, the absolute. Enquiry was condemned as blasphemy. Servitude was the highest virtue. And by such precepts and training, certain things came to be regarded as self-evident, as sacred of their truth, but because of constant and per Persistent repetition. All progress has essentially been an unmasking of divinity and mystery, of alleged sacred eternal truth. It has been a gradual elimination of the abstract and the substitution in its place of the real, the concrete. In short, of fact against fancy, of knowledge against ignorance, of light against darkness. That slow and arduous liberation of the individual is not accomplished by the aid of the state. On the contrary, it was by continuous conflict, by a life and death struggle with the state, that even the smallest vestige of independence and freedom has been won. It has cost mankind much time and blood to secure what little has gained so far from kings, tsars, and governments. The great heroic figure of that long Golgotha has been man. It has always been the individual, often alone and singly at other times in unity and cooperation with others of his kind, who has fought and bled in the age-long battle against suppression and oppression, against the powers that enslave and degrade him. More than that, and more significant, it was man, the individual, whose soul first rebelled against injustice and degradation. It was the individual who first conceived the idea of resistance to the conditions under which he chafed. In short, it is always the individual who is the parent of the liberating thought, as well as of the deed. <clears throat> this refers not only to political struggles, but to the entire gamut of human life and effort in all ages and climes. It has always been the individual, the man of strong mind and will to liberty, who paved the way for every human advance, for every step toward a freer and better world. In science, philosophy, and art, as well as in industry, whose genius rose to the heights, conceiving the impossible visualizing its realization and imbuing others with his enthusiasm to work and strive for it. Socially speaking, it was always the prophet, the seer, the idealist who dreamed of a world more to his heart's desire and who served as the beacon light on the road to greater achievement. The state, every government, whatever its form, character, or color, be it absolute or constitutional, monarchy or republic, fascist, Nazi, or Bolshevik, is by its very nature conservative static, intolerant of change and opposed to it. Whatever changes it undergoes are always the result of pressure exerted upon it, pressure strong enough to compel the ruling powers to submit peaceably or otherwise generally otherwise, that is, by revolution. Moreover, the inherent conservatism of government, of authority of any kind, unavoidably becomes reactionary. For two reasons. First, because it is in the nature of government not only to retain the power it has, but also to strengthen, widen, and perpetuate it, nationally as well as internationally. The stronger authority grows, the greater the state and its power, the less it can tolerate a similar authority or political power alongside of itself. The psychology of government demands that its influence and prestige constantly grow at home and abroad, and it exploits every opportunity to increase it. This tendency is motivated by the financial and commercial interests backed by the government, represented and served by it. The fundamental raison d'etre of every government to which, incidentally, historians of former days willfully shut their eyes has become too obvious now for even professors to ignore. 
The other factor which impels governments to become even more conservative and reactionary is their inherent distrust of the individual and fear of individuality. Our political and social scheme cannot afford to tolerate the individual and his constant quest for innovation. In self-defense, quote-unquote, the state therefore suppresses, persecutes, punishes, and even deprives the individual of life. It is aided in this by every institution that stands for the preservation of the existing order. It resorts to every form of violence and force, and its efforts are supported by the moral indignation of the majority against the heretic, the social dissenter, and the political rebel. The majority for centuries drilled in state worship, trained in discipline and obedience, and subdued by the awe of authority in the home, the school, the church, and the press. The strongest bulwark of authority is uniformity. The least divergence from it is the greatest crime. The wholesale mechanization of modern life has increased uniformity a thousandfold. It is everywhere present in habits, tastes, dress, thoughts, ideas. Its most concentrated dullness is public opinion. Few have the courage to stand out against it. He who refuses to submit is at once labeled queer, different, and decried as a disturbing element in the comfortable stagnancy of modern life. Perhaps even more than constituted authority, it is social uniformity and sameness that harass the individual most. His very uniqueness, separateness, and differentiation make him an alien, not only in his native place but even in his own home, often more so than the foreign-born who generally falls in with the established. In the true sense, one's native land with its background of tradition, early impressions, reminiscences, and other things dear to one is not enough to make sensitive human beings feel at home. A certain atmosphere of belonging, the consciousness of being at one, quote-unquote, with the people and environment is more essential to one's feeling of home. This holds good in relation to one's family the smaller local circle, as well as the larger phase of the life and activities commonly called one's country. The individual whose vision encompasses the whole world often feels nowhere so hedged in and out of touch with his surroundings than in his native land. In pre-war time, the individual could at least escape national and family boredom. The whole world was open to his longings and his quests. Now the world has become a prison and life continual solitary confinement. Especially is this true since the advent of dictatorship, right and left. Friedrich Nietzsche called the state a cold monster. What would he have called the hideous beast in the garb of modern dictatorship? Not that government had ever allowed much scope to the individual. The champions of the new state ideology do not grant even that much. The individual is nothing. They declare it is the collectivity which counts. Nothing less than the cl complete surrender of the individual will satisfy the insatiable appetite of the new deity. Strangely enough, the loudest advocates of this new gospel are to be found among the British and American intelligentsia. Just now, they are enamored with the dictatorship of the proletariat. In theory only, to be sure. In practice, they still prefer the few liberties in their own respective countries. They go to Russia for a short visit, or as a salesman of the revolution, but they feel safer and more comfortable at home. <clears throat> Perhaps it is not only lack of courage which keeps these good Britishers and Americans in their native lands rather than the millennium to come. Subconsciously, there may lurk the feeling that individuality remains the most fundamental fact of all human association, suppressed and persecuted, yet never defeated, and in the long run the victor. The genius of man, which is but another name for personality and individuality, bores its way through all the caverns of dogma, through the thick walls of tradition and custom, defying all taboos, setting authority at naught, facing contumely and the scaffold, ultimately to be blessed as prophet and martyr by succeeding generations. But for the genius of man, that inherent, persistent quality of individuality, we would still be roaming the primeval forests. Peter Kropotkin has shown what wonderful results this unique force of man's individuality has achieved when strengthened by cooperation with other individualities. The one-sided and entirely inadequate Darwinian theory of the struggle for existence 
received its biological and sociological completion from the great anarchist scientist and thinker. In his profound work, Mutual Aid, Kropotkin shows that in the animal kingdom as well as in human society, cooperation, as opposed to internecine strife and struggle, has worked for the survival and evolution of the species. He demonstrated that only mutual aid and voluntary cooperation, not the omnipotent, all-devastating state, can create the basis for a free individual and associational life. At present, the individual is the pawn of the zealots of dictatorship and the equally obsessed zealots of rugged individualism. The excuse of the former is its claim of a new objective. The latter does not even make a pretense to anything new. As a matter of fact, rugged individualism has learned nothing and forgotten nothing. Under its guidance, the brute struggle for physical existence is still kept up. Strange as it may seem, and utterly absurd as it is, the struggle for physical survival goes merrily on, though the necessity for it has entirely disappeared. Indeed, the struggle is being continued apparently because there is no necessity for it. Does not so-called overproduction prove it? Is not the worldwide economic crisis an eloquent demonstration that the struggle for existence is being maintained by the blindness of rugged individualism at the risk of its own destruction? One of the insane characteristics of this struggle is the complete negation of the relation of the producer to the things that he produces. The average worker has no inner point of contact with the industry in which he is employed in, and he is a stranger to the process of production of which he is a mechanical part. Like any other cog of the machine, he is replaceable at any time by other similarly depersonalized human beings. The intellectual proletarian, though he foolishly thinks himself a free agent, is not much better off. He, too, has as little choice or self-direction in his particular métier as his brother who works with his hands. Material considerations and desire for greater social prestige are usually the deciding factors in the vocation of the intellectual. Added to it is the tendency to follow in the footsteps of family tradition and become doctors, lawyers, teachers, engineers, etc. The groove requires less effort and personality. In consequence, nearly everybody is out of place in our present scheme of things. The masses plod on partly because their senses have been dulled by the deadly routine of work and because they must eke out an existence. This applies with even greater force to the political fabric of today. There is no place in its texture for free choice of independent thought and activity. There is a place only for voting and tax-paying puppets. The interests of the state and those of the individual differ fundamentally and are antagonistic to each other. The state and the political and economic institutions it supports can exist only by fashioning the individual to their particular purpose, training him to respect law and order, quote-unquote, teaching him obedience, submission, and unquestioning faith in the wisdom and justice of government, above all, loyal service and complete self-sacrifice when the state commands it, as in war. The state puts itself and its interests even above the claims of religion and of God, it punishes religious or conscientious scruples against individuality because there is no individuality without liberty, and liberty is the greatest menace to authority. The struggle of the individual against these tremendous odds is the more difficult, too often dangerous to life and limb, because it is not truth or falsehood which serves as the criterion of the opposition he meets. It is not the validity or usefulness of his thought or activity which rouses against him the forces of the state and of public opinion. The persecution of the innovator and pro Protestant has always been inspired by fear on the part of constituted authority of having its infallibility questioned and its power undermined. Man's true liberation, individual and collective, lies in his emancipation from authority and from the belief in it. All human evolution has been a struggle in that direction and for that object. It is not invention and mechanics which constitute development. The ability to travel at the rate of 100 miles an hour is no evidence of being civilized. True civilization is to be measured by the individual, the unit of all social life, by his individuality and the extent to which it is free to have its being, to grow and expand unhindered by invasive and coercive authority. Socially speaking, the criterion of civilization and culture is the degree of liberty and economic opportunity which the individual enjoys, 
of social and international unity and cooperation unrestricted by man-made laws and other artificial obstacles, by the absence of privileged castes and by the reality of liberty and human dignity. In short, by the true emancipation of the individual. Political absolutism has been abolished because men have realized in the course of time that absolute power is evil and destructive. But the same thing is true of all power, whether it be the power of privilege, of money, of the priest, of the politician, or of the so-called democracy. In its effect on individuality, it matters little what the particular character of coercion is, whether it be as black as fascism, as yellow as Nazism, or as pretentiously red as Bolshevism. It is power that corrupts and degrades both master and slave, and it makes no difference whether the power is wielded by an autocrat, by a parliament, or Soviets. More pernicious than the power of a dictator is that of a class, the most terrible, the tyranny of a majority. The long process of history has taught man that division and strife mean death, and that unity and cooperation advance his cause, multiply his strength, and further his welfare. The spirit of government has always worked against the social application of this vital lesson, except where it served the state and aided its own particular interests. It is this anti-progressive and anti-social spirit of the state and of the privileged castes back of it, which has been responsible for the bitter struggle between man and man. The individual and ever larger groups of individuals are beginning to see beneath the surface of the established order of things. No longer are they so blinded as in the past by the glare and tinsel of the state idea and of the quote-unquote blessings of rugged individualism. Man is reaching out for the wider scope of human relations which liberty alone can give. For true liberty is not a mere scrap of paper called constitution, legal right, or law. It is not an abstraction derived from the non-reality known as the state. It is not the negative thing of being free from something, because with such freedom you may starve to death. Real freedom, true liberty, is positive. It is the freedom to something, it is the liberty to be, to do. In short, the liberty of actual and active opportunity. That sort of liberty is not a gift. It is the natural right of man, of every human being. It cannot be given. It cannot be conferred by any law or government. The need of it, the longing for it, is inherent in the individual. Disobedience to every form of coercion is the instinctive expression of it. Rebellion and revolution are the more or less conscious attempt to achieve it. Those manifestations, individual and social, are fundamentally expressions of the values of man. That those values may be nurtured, the community must realize that its greatest and most lasting asset is the unit, the individual. In religion, as in politics, people speak of abstractions and believe they are dealing with realities. But when it does come to the real and the concrete, most people seem to lose vital touch with it. It may well be because reality alone is too matter-of-fact, too cold, to enthuse the human soul. It can be aroused to enthusiasm only by things out of the commonplace, out of the ordinary. In other words, the ideal is the spark that fires the imagination and hearts of men. Some ideal is needed to rouse man out of the inertia and humdrum of his existence and turn the abject slave into a heroic figure. Right here, of course, comes the Marxist objector who has outmarched Marx himself. To such a one, man is a mere puppet in the hands of that metaphysical almighty called economic determinism, or more vulgarly, the class struggle. Man's will, individual and collective, his psychic life and mental orientation count for almost nothing with our Marxist and do not affect his conception of human history. No intelligent student will deny the importance of the economic factor in the social growth and development of mankind, but only narrow and willful dogmatism can persist in remaining blind to the important role played by an idea as conceived by the imagination and aspirations of the individual. It were vain and unprofitable to attempt to balance one factor as against another in human experience. No one single factor in the complex of individual or social behavior can be designated as the factor of decisive quality. We know too little 
and may never know enough of human psychology to weigh and measure the relative values of this or that factor in determining man's conduct, to form such dogmas in their social connection and connotations is nothing short of bigotry. Yet, perhaps it has its uses, for the very attempt to do so proved the persistence of the human will and confutes the Marxists. <clears throat> Fortunately, even some Marxists are beginning to see that all is not well with the Marxian creed. After all, Marx was but human, all too human, and hence by no means infallible. The practical application of economic determinism in Russia is helping to clear the minds of the more intelligent Marxists. This can be seen in the transvaluation of Marxian values going on in socialist and even communist ranks in some European countries. They are slowly realizing that their theory has overlooked the human element, the dimension, as a socialist paper put it. Important as the economic factor is, it is not enough. The rejuvenation of mankind needs the inspiration and energizing force of an ideal. Such an ideal I see in anarchism. To be sure, not the popular misrepresentations of anarchism spread by the worshippers of state and authority. I mean the philosophy of a new social order based on the released energies of the individual and the free association of liberated individuals. Of all social theories, anarchism alone steadfastly proclaims that society exists for man, not man for society. The sole legitimate purpose of society is to serve the needs and advance the aspirations of the individual, and only by doing so can it justify its existence and be an aid to progress and culture. The political parties and men savagely scrambling for power will scorn me as hopelessly out of tune with our time. I cheerfully admit the charge. I find comfort in the assurance that their hysteria lacks enduring quality. Their hosanna is but of the hour. Man's yearning for liberation from all authority and power will never be soothed by their cracked song, and man's quest for freedom from every shackle is eternal. It must and will go on. This has been Individual, Society, and the State, written by Emma Goldman in 1940, originally found on the Anarchist Library. Read and recorded by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz, June 2nd, 2022.